Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, from our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's word for our consideration continues our look at the Gospel of Mark. Tonight we are in chapter 6. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. Amen. I've been a pastor now for nearly 17 years. I've been privileged to, pre to preach in places like Florida, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin. I've preached to congregations with as few as 10, and I've presented before more than 2,000. I don't say this to toot my own horn, but just to give you an idea that I've had a wide range of experiences. I'm pretty comfortable talking in front of people in just about any situation. But there's two places that would make me more nervous than anywhere else if I were asked to preach there. One would be the seminary, and the second, faith evangelical for the church, the final. What's so intimidating about those two places? Well, I think you probably can figure out what makes the seminary intimidating. It's the audience. It's the professors who are tempted to remember you as that student who didn't always pay attention, who didn't always do so well in class. And it's your classmates who all know all too well your weaknesses and the skeletons that are in your closet. I think you can understand what would make the seminary intimidating. But what's so scary about faith evangelical Lutheran Church in Fond du Lac? That's my home church. That's the church where I grew up. That's the place where people are tempted to see me as that short little kid with the high-pitched voice. Or the teenager who, temp who tended to take church softball too seriously. You get the picture, right? We often think that we can always go home, that home is a place where we'll always be welcome, or always be appreciated, maybe even celebrated. But for pastors, at least, truth be told, contrary to popular belief, you can't always go home. And today we see such a stumbling block negatively impact the preaching ministry of Jesus. Jesus left there and went to his hometown. His disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were amazed. It all seemed to start out so well. Jesus went home to visit. He brought his friends with him. They went to church together. To the synagogue that he had grown up going to every single week. But this time, he's the one doing the teaching. And at first glance, we might think it couldn't have gone any better. It says, People, many who heard him, were amazed. And, and that word amazed literally has a picture of their minds being blown. It was a mind-blowing moment for that synagogue in Nazareth. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. And that's the key word. Believe. They couldn't believe. They didn't believe. Their questions betrayed their lack of faith in Jesus. They asked, where did this man learn these things? What is this wisdom that has been given to this man? How is it that miracles such as these are performed by his hand? They should have been looking for someone just like Jesus. They knew their Old Testament well. They knew what God had promised through Moses, that a prophet like him would come to them from, from their own brothers with God's word in his mouth. Their logic should have told them where the wisdom was coming from, how the miracles were happening. It should have come to the same conclusion that Nicodemus came to in John chapter 3 when he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these miraculous signs we are doing unless God is with them. Jesus' deeds and his words pointed to the obvious answer to their questions, but they never got there. Why? Isn't this the carpenter, the 
the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? They knew him. He'd grown up there. He was the carpenter. Nazareth was a small town with small town tendencies, narrow-mindedness and prejudices and cliques and petty family pride that those with small towns were right in Nazareth. And as the old saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. For the people of Nazareth, the familiarity of the boy who used to play in their streets and worship in their synagogues now had them looking down on him with contempt. Mark says they took offense at him. Literally, they were tripped up by him. They couldn't make sense of it all. They couldn't get past their preconceived notions of him. Which led Jesus to say, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own house. And Mark concludes this short section by saying he could not do any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went around the villages teaching. The people of Nazareth had their minds blown that this carpenter, this hometown carpenter, could be teaching and preaching and healing. But that mind-blowing amazement led to unbelief. And their unbelief led to Jesus being amazed. Only two times in the scriptures is Jesus described as being amazed. The first is at the faith of the centurion, a faith which logically shouldn't have been there, a faith which the Holy Spirit had created against all odds. And the second time is here. Jesus is amazed at the unbelief that never should have been, an unbelief despite all of the evidence staring them in the faith, an unbelief despite every seeming advantage. Ask yourself the question, what kind of amazement would Jesus show here at Isa? It's easy to look at the people of Nazareth and say, how could they? They had Jesus right there in their midst. They were tripped up by familiarity. But isn't it true that our familiarity with the Word of God sometimes in some ways has led us to take it for granted? Hasn't our familiarity with the Word of God led us to think that we know it all already so we don't need to hear it again? Hasn't our familiarity with the Word of God led us to neglect it, even despise it? But maybe we're not crazy about the guy who's sharing it? May God forgive us for treating His Word with contempt. May we lay those sins at the foot of the cross and look to the Savior who bled and died for us, even as we have so often taken offense at him. The thing is, though, Jesus knew this would happen. God had promised it. What do we read in Isaiah 53? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by them. Even his own family had treated him that way, as we've already seen. And yet none of this stopped Jesus from carrying out his mission. Even despite the rejection in his hometown, Jesus went to the other villages, and he kept on teaching, and he kept on preaching, and he kept on working God's plan of salvation for people who rarely said thank you, he did not appreciate the many things he was doing for them. Jesus kept on working for people who despised and rejected him. He kept on working for those who took him and his word for granted. He kept on working for the people of Nazareth. The people like you and me. His love for us and his desire for us to be with him in heaven is what kept his face set toward the cross. It is because of what Jesus did in our place that allows God to look at us and be properly amazed. 
amazed and smitten with his children who are wearing his own righteousness. Well pleased with those who strive to serve him, a father with his arms flung wide, ready to receive his beloved, preparing works for us to do so that we can properly say thank you for all that he's done for us. May our familiarity with Jesus not lead us to despise him, but to cherish him all the more. The theme for the sermon is you can't always go home. That theme, I didn't realize that that is actually the title of a book written by a man named Thomas Wolfe. And in that book, he indicates that if you try to live in the past, if you try to remember a place from the past, you're always going to be disappointed because when you go back, things will have changed so dramatically. And so you can't go home again. I don't think he's right. At least not when it comes to God and his word and his house. While things certainly do change in churches, there's one thing that never changes. The word. The message of Jesus always stays the same. It's unchanging. And even if you've been tripped up by it in the past, and even if you've left it for a time, you can come home again. Jesus wants you to come home again. You can always come home again to God's free and faithful grace. And maybe you know someone who feels like they can't come here. That they can't come home again. Assure them that they can. Assure them that Jesus loves them and wants them to come home. And so I'm changing my theme. Let them know that contrary to popular belief, you can always come home to God's house again. Amen.